the time has come for my people to go. I'm not a queen, I'm a servant of the people. I'm not a king, I'm a servant of the people. It's what the people demand, and we're going to keep fighting till we get that land. I'm not a queen, I'm a servant of the people. I'm not a king, I'm a servant of the people. It's time to rise to get what we want, we got to organize. Greetings, good day, good afternoon, good evening, good night, good people, good comrades, wherever you are in the world. I'm Jamila. I am here with my comrade Evan. As you can see, hey, there is no video <laughs> because we have been having tech issues. Apologies for not being on last week. We just it's just wild out here. So we are here. We want to be here in whatever way we can, even uh, if it's limited and it's not visual, but we're here to still send the messages and have a political education session. And of course, we are in the Kaji circle representing the All African People's Revolutionary Party. And the objective of the All African People's Revolutionary Party is to have a unified Africa under scientific socialism. If you have any questions, regarding where we stand on these issues, you can go to our general international site, aaprp-intl.org. And of course you can contact us. There are many ways to do that. And we have the stream going. You can ask us questions in the comments, whatever it is, but we will answer those questions to the best of our abilities. And I think to that point, we're talking about the importance of primary sources. So answering things to the best of our abilities, we're also going to get things from primary sources and have an analysis based on what we learned from those things before we get into that discussion. Of course, we are here to honor our ancestors before we do any of that, because without them, we wouldn't be here doing the work that we are doing without the work that they've paved the way for, we are here now doing that. And we hope we are doing our ancestors proud. Of course, we can always do better, but we hope we are doing as, as well as we can at this point. So Evan is going to do a little uh, introduction to our ancestors. The two ancestors we're gonna honor for this episode are Ruben Umiobe, hope I pronounced that correctly, and Mini Maud Lena Gordon. So Ruben Niobe was a anti-colonialist, a pan-Africanist leader of a leader from a country that's now known as Cameroon. Uh, he, was part, he helped create the Cameroon's People's Union in, in 1948. And initially and initially uh, he was about making sure oh, making sure that the struggle against uh, colonialism against whether it's German or French uh, colonialism or English colonialism was uh, nonviolent, but after, uh, in, in the midst of his trade union activity, the colonizers shot well, multiple people and killed them. And so later on, uh, the UPC, the Cameroon People's Union, took up arms against uh, the French. And, and one of the things that he kept in mind is that you, even like, understanding the conditions and one thing he also in mind was that this was work alongside the work of the Viet Minh in Vietnam, as well as the Algerians uh, in fighting against, like both fighting against the French and later the U.S. and U.S. experience in the case of Vietnam. Uh, and he was he was killed by uh, the French army in 1958. And the second, uh, Mini Maud Gordon, she was a black nationalist. Uh, she was. She has established the peace movement of Ethiopia alongside another ancestor that we talked about before, Green Mother Moore. This is about uh, repatriation to Africa, uh, specifically Liberia. Uh, she was a member of the UNIA, uh, Universal Negro Improvement Association, part of her work in uh, trying to establish uh, Af contact with Africans on the continent, as well as later work alongside from Japanese, uh, it's called the the Pacific Movement of the Eastern World, 
You know, I would establish some Afro Asian solidarity, the FBI, uh, Gong and her, and spent a lot of time in prison as a result of her work. And if you want to find out more information about uh, Lena Gordon and other uh, women who were involved in um, black nationalist movements, you can look at the book by Keisha Blaine and some of like uh, Dr. Keisha Blaine and some of our other work. And as far as Ruben Niobe, you can also look at some of the work by Richard Joseph uh, for more information about him. And you're talking about reading particular books or particular pieces of information that goes into what we are addressing here. Why is studying, not just reading, but studying primary sources important? The main thing is with primary sources is that you get an idea of what these people, these organizations, um, both of those who are allied or accomplices with people who are organizing for the liberation of people, as well as those who are fighting against them, you get an idea of what they're thinking, what they're planning to do. And so while it's, it's nice to see, maybe see a quote on, let's say you're in, uh, in a classroom or in some library or some, something you see on a web page or, or a tweet, a Facebook message, so on and so forth, or an advertisement, you see some quotes from, from different leaders that you say, oh, oh, that's, that's heartening. But sometimes, well, a lot of times, those quotations might be taken out of context. So they might be saying one thing and when it's just given by itself, but in the greater context of the work that they, they, they speak about, whether it's a speech or some writing, it's, in a, it's it means something totally different. So it's always a good idea to make sure that you look at what they're actually saying as far as the full context to say, do they is this what they really mean? Or, or was this a response to? They like even, even on, as I said, like mentioned two scholars who did work, like they did work on each of them. They, they also had to look at the primary sources in order to come up with uh, the analysis, the historiographies for each person. So, so it's always, always a good idea to check what their sources and see what are they looking at? What is, are these things legitimate? And if they are legitimate, or what kind of conclusions are they coming to? And if they aren't legitimate, okay, where, where they go wrong? Right. How would you know if you're looking at, say, a second or third source, which is obviously giving you confirmation bias, why would you simply believe that? For instance, if you keep asking, why are the cops continuing to kill us? Why uh, is this thing going on? Why, why are we poll? Why, whatever questions you have about injustice in the US, for instance, why would those same things not happen at the hands of US international policy elsewhere? Why would you separate that? So saying that Fidel Castro is a dictator or whatever, but somehow, the conditions that exist for you are individualized, but you don't think that's happening elsewhere. So you have to think, why are these things happening? And why are, is the same system that's operating under injustice where I am, why would they be uh, telling the truth about some other place where injustice is? So we need to ask ourselves these particular questions and what, what's the saying? Capitalism lies all the time. And when it tells the truth, it's the result of a double negative or a double lie. So why would you think that the CNN or MSNBC or Fox or any of these sources, whatever you usually look at under the auspices of capitalism, why would you think a narrative around another country, especially when it is a country that is working on self-determination, when it's a country that is working the opposite of capitalism, why would you think that a capitalist news source is telling the truth about that area of the world? So we need to ask ourselves these questions. If I don't like what's going on under the auspices of capitalism happening to me in my individual life or my family or the people in my circle, we, we have to ask ourselves <laughs> about the conditions of other people under the, you may not see the auspices at work, 
but it's either through your tax dollars or it's under the hands of something else, but guarantee that same system that's working against you is working against oppressed peoples globally. And to automatically think something is good or bad based on these little pieces of information you get without understanding the actual source, we need to definitely do better than that. Kwame Ture was discussing in an interview, he was saying, well, why would you say that Nazism is bad? Why would you say all these things are bad? Like, how do you know if you haven't looked at the source? It's not saying that, it, 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 you know, I understand that it is a bad thing because I have studied as to the history and the foundation of how this thing came to be. So I have an understanding of why it's bad. But I'm asking you, and you're just saying it's bad. How do you know if you didn't study it? So we have to really, whether or not we agree with something, we still have to study it to come to our own conclusion as to whether we support or don't support something. But if we're just automatically like, well, the schools told us it was bad, or the news channels told us it was bad, or it's automatically bad. But if you were to, well, they encourage you to, when you go to school, study this thing when you do a report on it. You have to read, you have to study it, and you have to have a deposition, if you will, to explain why something is bad or isn't bad, why you support something or don't support something. So why would you not do that in other aspects of your life? That makes sense to us. I don't know, hopefully it makes sense to you. If you are that invested in something, you're going to research it, you're going to study it, and you're going to be passionate about it when you talk about it to people. So why not do that when it comes to your liberation, when it comes to the liberation of folks around the world who are oppressed? Don't just be like, well, why are Cubans starving? Well, why are Venezuelans starving? <laughs> There's plenty of documentation as to tell you why. You just have to seek it out and study it. So it's important to not uh, only look at the histories behind something, but the present sense. So what are people doing as a means of countering that? Are people countering that? But it has to be from the voices of those communities, of those people who are looking for and organizing for self-determination. So looking at both sides, you're getting one side, the capitalist side, and they're telling you, well, those people are poor because communism. How do you know that? Where, where are people getting the information that, Communism did this, that, or the other to a lot of people, but at the same time, defend capitalism that's doing the same thing that you're saying communism is doing. What sources, if you have any questions, like ask us what sources and we can help you towards that. But to just automatically believe what a capitalist system is telling you, saying, well, the, this thing said it was bad, but you're getting it again from the actual source. Primary sources are of most important to understand the side of what's actually happening to the people, the getting the experiences of the direct experiences of the people it's happening to. You know, obviously CNN or whatever, you, you can identify when CNN, when you don't agree with it, but again, why would you agree with something you're seeing injustice? And then it, it, why would that same injustice not happen? at those same places. So just kind of just back to my primary point. <laughs> yes, the primary point to the primary source argument. And, <laughs> and, uh, and, uh, and this goes uh, like not only with regards to uh, pol political issues, but I think especially the last two years, this was definitely, this definitely apply for uh, what's happening now with COVID. As it, especially we hear when you talk about uh, studies of but you see stuff on the news about what to like, what to do, what not to do, what you should take, what don't do this, do this, this, and then even beyond that, like just any like generally, uh, when you especially you see news reports saying, oh, like taking this will, uh, getting a lot of sleep will like, getting like eight hours of sleep will improve your like, mental acuity by x x percent, or or eating this food will like increase your levels of blood pressure or something like that. Like, again, you you have to make sure that some articles do this, some don't. So that, yep, if you're going to see to what extent it's true, you have to look at the primary source, which is like the research. 
like what's the sample size of the researcher? Are they doing double blind? Like, is this uh, like, what phase are they doing for a certain drug or or some like uh, like what's the sample? Like, like not only the size of the sample, but also who are they studying? Is this in humans? Is this in animals? Are any of the people doing research getting funding from some source? So again, you you always have to make sure you look at like what's actually happening and just not just take sort of like the headline or like the small blurb of what's happening. And and and, and to go back to the point on political point is that with uh, I like Jamil was saying with regards to Nazis are saying you might hear about the whole oh the Nazis are socialists they said socialists in the name and I think we might mention this on earlier episode, but there's a source, which is the, it's the address to the industry called the Dusseldorf in 1932. And there, like he's, I mean, Hitler is talking to like maybe a bunch of German like industry like leadership. And the basis of it is not exactly, hey, we're going to nationalize it and give it all to the people. It's, it's like, if you look at the source, it's, it's saying, I'm, I'm, I'm with you. You're like, yeah, there might be some difficulty, but again, I'm with you. So and again, if you want to dispute that, you can read it and say, oh, I, I interpret it differently. But again, you have to look at the source. I remember a short time ago, there was a 60 Minutes uh, piece about China. I mean, like, it seems like every other week there's a 60 Minutes piece by China these days, or it's like China, Russia, whichever. But um, it was about uh, Xi Jinping and like, like what, like some of the things that the uh, Chinese Communist Party are doing. And I remember, I think uh, the uh, 60 Minutes interview, I think it was Leslie Stahl, said, hey, I remember she said, well, that's communism. And she said, like, communism as if, like, oh, it's automatically a bad thing. Like, oh, that's communism. First, you have to look at, okay, is what the Chinese are doing? Is that, are they going towards the staying a classless, stateless society, which is what communism is, regardless if you're, if you talk about Marxist, if you're talking about a Marxist or left Marxist or anarchist or whatever, or indigenous point of view of communism, again, you have to look at different sources to be like, like that the definition that communism, some people give to communism, differs from what people who actually work towards communism or, or are like actually actively trying to undermine people who are working towards communism say. That's the whole importance of looking at what they're, what they're doing. I have another question for you. What are some instances of sources that for all intents and purposes are primary sources, but have been totally fabricated in one way or another and have integrated themselves into a culture, which is now seen as not only a primary source, but true. I think the, the, two, the two biggest examples are the Willie Lynch letter and the Provost of the Elders of Zion. And in both cases, they're they're seen as oh, see uh, again, like we talked, like we're, we're mentioning that uh, the importance of primary sources. But but just like in other cases, sometimes some of the stuff you do see, and this is it's not just like, uh, me saying because we're as I'm studying uh, history, you know, I grad grad from we we understand and in, in library science that that whenever you are looking at sources, you have to make sure that. So sometimes the sources you get, they might be fabricated. And you'll see this, and you see this also in this like military standpoint of what they call like black propaganda, gray propaganda, white propaganda. There's something like some of it, uh, some of the propaganda that comes out is made to, as if someone else said it, and it's obviously false. And some of it is like, stuff that is true, but the extent of the truth is somewhat hidden by some other things. And with the case of like, the letter and the protocols, they both make it seem as if, oh, okay, we have proof of how to how they make it so that black people, or Africans, oh, or new Africans have are after each other and do this like divide and conquer. And with the protocols, it's basically saying, oh, this is how the uh, Jewish people are able to run the world or something again. But again, in both cases, uh, they're both fabricated. So, and but despite that, people still think, well, it's fabricated. But God, it's, most of the things are true. But again, you have to you have to look at like a lot of things to say that either disprove those things are saying, or saying, or they're saying something totally different than what you think they're saying, or, or what you perceive it to say. 
And again, it involves again, a materialistic point of view of both why those things are created and why people use those sources to propagate some either some reactionary point of view or something that leads you astray. It's always like, it is always helpful to see so they like, make sure that you have those like collective conversations to make sure that that you're not pulling stuff out of you, you know, <laughs> and that things are what they are actually are. And what would be a way to counter that primary source? What would be saying, well, it's the only source that's happening. How would you figure out if somebody said, well, this actually isn't true? What would be a good way to find sources to assure that it is not true? If there's, if there's a bunch of documentation, many, many books uh, discussing the Willie Lynch letters, many uh, conferences about it, et cetera. So people have discussed this document as it was a, a, a piece of history and time and people validating it as to say, well, this is why Africans are in the conditions they are today versus reading something like how Europe underdeveloped Africa, as opposed to reading France Fanon and the uh, writings on colonialism, capitalism and slavery, Eric Williams. So what would be a way to kind of obviously reading those books would be like, hey, here's actually the roots of why we're in the conditions we're at today. What are some other ways to do that? Well, one thing is what tends to happen is that something that we see in history, uh, that one thing that we learn as far as like, we do historical research is that it's both our art and the science. And it's, it's sometimes, sometimes like when you're doing like to talk about popular history, the art part of it might get, and this again, it's not disgracing art by any means, but sometimes the art part of it gets like, seems like it feels better or reaffirms some kind of. Uh, like some sort of status quo or nation to understand are there any sources from around that time that could verify that this happened like how long has this been discussed uh, or obviously in the case of history like some some new artifacts or oral histories or whatever they come up all the time so so just because it has been talked about at the time doesn't mean that it's necessarily false at the same time if you Think about how these come about. You still have to do extra research, so you can't just look at something. And and, and as you see this the case now, you mentioned earlier about uh, social media that you'll you see some memes saying talk like doing some basic five second history or something like that, some like tweet or TikTok or whatever, whatever uh, social media aspect uh, that there's still something a quick sound bite or or image that. You have to make sure that there are other ways that can verify it. And in the case of the Lynch, uh, Lynch speech or letter, when it when was it first discussed? And if you, if you see, look at when it was first discussed, then you can say, oh, oh, you can't. This is weird. And about you know, the way that doesn't really verify that it was like something that was found is from the most fabricate. And you see this often, Gason, uh, especially with regards to reactionary uh, governments that they'll try to simplify history of ruling class they try to simplify history in a way that sort of lies that there are there were some contradictions but they'll just lie the fact that oh look at how great this was I think a great example is the fact that you see the what happened in the last few years with regards to uh, confederate statues that a lot of those statues came about not right right after the the civil war but during the like the rise of like the like the worst fight fight for African liberation within the United States, that they came out as a response of oh, what's all of these people, and and then you see that some of these statues came about in places where they had they had no, nothing to do with the Civil War. So, uh, yeah, but yeah, but going back, they always have to have some context with everything that you see. Uh, when did this letter come out? When did those protocols come out? And you know. Like why this, and you know, and also you have to understand like the greater context of divide and conquer has been a thing. Like, like and, you, and like Jamil say, you, like you're saying that all these things about uh, underdevelopment of 
mass exploitation of enslaved and so forth, been written by people who will actually look at legitimate sources, both from the people doing exploiting and people who have been exploited. I think I think the reason why something like that letter or a speech is so powerful and like it might like, escape that sort of uh, scrutiny is just like we don't want to have something simple that says, oh, oh, we got this some one guy, like one guy is just bragging about how he made it so that Africans would go after each other or or he found, or, he's, or like the case of protocols or, or like with Henry Ford and the Henry Ford and some stuff he shared. For example, is oh, this is why Jews were doing this and this and this. Like we were talking about earlier with the uh, aspects of like of like the so-called the socialism of fools. They, uh, like it's talked about with us, like so sort of like these anti-Semitic canards. You have to look at all the con that the context. Look at a scholarship that says, hmm, maybe you have to you have to look a little closer at this. You know, we want to definitely reiterate that it's important to study both sides of the perspective because in order to understand the history of something, what we get in the schools is, well, you had, okay, the American Revolution, whatever, and then you had, you know, enslavement of people and then you had civil rights. Like there's no full perspective of the conditions of the people you're addressing, this, the result of what happened but you're not addressing the foundation of why those results came to be. So to study both ends of the situation, particularly when it comes to the oppression of marginalized peoples, of colonized peoples, to not study both sides and then feel like you've come to a conclusion just because things are bad, it doesn't really explain, yes, things are bad. We understand these things happen but we have to understand the material conditions of people in order to understand why they were able to further be marginalized. What happened before the marginalization happened? So yeah, when you get in the capitalist schools, you know, people talk about, well, the American Revolution, and we wanted to get away from the Brit. Like there's pages upon pages upon pages of that. We felt so oppressed under the British monarchy. We were to, you know, freedom of religion, all this. To this day, that is emphasized. And these are the values that are emphasized. But then when it comes to the actual oppression of people, why are people starving once again? Why is there, there racism? Why is there sexism? Why, is, why are there all these isms? They don't teach you about those things in these schools. So you have to figure all those things out for yourself because this is not, and we're talking about the US, this is not a society that prepares you for those things. Like you just go out in the world and you experience it and then you have all those questions because there's no foundation. And then when you say these things happen to me, you're like, well, no, that's not, you know, that's not the values of this system, but it's the very foundation of those values in this system. And so you're meant to be demoralized. Um, under the system or to be gaslighted under the system because you as an individual are experiencing, but that's not the, the total values. So you're asking these questions, you have to study the foundation of the system in order to bring yourself to an answer. And of course, continually study those, those things. Like don't say, well, I have an answer now, it's over because then you have a whole world to study because U.S. international policy, U.S. international policy exists. So the way people think, it's just be, not, nothing beyond the four walls of this country. And it's like, well, I'm okay. So you know, everything else must be okay. If I'm feeling oppressed, then something is wrong. But if I'm doing okay on this particular day, then, you know, things are okay. I don't know why, I don't know why they're feeling a certain way. You know, y'all saying communism is great. Y'all have whatever you want, but y'all are suffering. It's like people are starving in the U.S. People are, it may not be the amount of homelessness or whatever, of houselessness in the U.S., but there's still you know, white supremacy <laughs> in places that have mixed economies. So there's, 
still uh, particular issues where people are being beaten by the police, the protesters are being paid. So that, that does not just happen in the US. That happens uh, places that have US military bases where the military is protecting particular resources. I mean, there are lots of examples of that. So to understand why a problem exists, you have to understand the source of that problem in order to resolve that problem. But a problem as big as, as the ones we're addressing cannot be solved individually. And I think that's the other thing we're conditioned to understand. <laughs> and then we have to go, well, well, they said I can solve a problem individually. Why is it not happening? Because you can't solve a problem of this nature individually. You have to solve it with the masses of the people. So when you see these movies, when you read these books, when you see all of these news sources, things that get passed for news stories about individuals saving the day, and you ask the question, well, how come it, you know, my life can't be resolved? I tried to do all these things and I got a job and, you know, and I'm not making enough. It's because there's a whole system that is involved. We have to find a way, you know, that person you think that's, oh man, they're too far off politically. No, I'm not an anarchist. You know, they might have some answers for you. They, they may, you know, be, you might think they're just spotting off nonsense, but sometimes the people who spot off nonsense make the most sense. So, you know, actually sit and listen to them and ask them some questions. Like, why, why do you think the way you do? What's going on? And they might actually hand you some information. So they'll, they'll be like, well, here's this book that I read. And then I, and then once you, read that book, I have more books for you. And they might have a whole library. And of course, you know, there, there's the echo chamber part. So people are reading according to their confirmation bias. You, if you go to that person, they're just giving you a particular type of source that feeds their confirmation bias, then that is up to you to go and read other sources and talk to different groups of people. Like you don't just come to a conclusion based on uh, a particular group of people that have singular thinking. You have to go, okay, you're telling me this is good or this is bad, but if that's all I'm hearing, I don't know why this other thing is good or bad. So you really have to meet all kinds of different people and come to uh, a conclusion, but also have an historical analysis. Um, we have to look at things dialectically, look at the positives and the negatives of things, and again, come to a conclusion that's always looking at those primary sources. If you are um, those documents that we were talking about, if you're reading that, you're like, well, I can't find any other sources that match that, then you have to question that. If you're reading like, is there a person named Willie Lynch? I don't know. And you can't find any other source, then I should tell you something. But People aren't doing that. A lot of people are not doing that. They're like, yeah, see, this is why it is. That's it. They're happy with the decision because it feeds their confirmation bias. So let's discuss confirmation bias for a little bit and why it is not particularly good to depend on that. Definitely. Uh, the confirmation bias is, and funny enough, I was actually doing an like, assignment Last and we're re we're doing stuff on reference sources with social sciences. One of the, uh, one of the articles that one of the things they talked about was the use of confirmation bias for like their racist or sexist or uh, one of the, like supremacist or their beliefs in their research. Uh, like for example, and I think uh, uh, Stephen Jay Gould's book, The Mismeasure of Man, like, he talks about how some of these social scientists and like the the 18th, 19th century, uh, utilized their, uh, their sort of belief in like the in the, in the domination of, of Europeans and, and the colonial possessions and so forth, and so use that to sort of justify like their conclusions regard with regards to the racial differences, like biological racial differences and intelligence and so forth. So it come about sources. That just like just reaffirms like oh 
Western Europeans are more superior to Southern Europeans are even more superior than Africans or indigenous people of so-called Americas and so forth. If you have like, data coming out of it, all you're doing is just, just reconfirming what you're thinking about. So, and that's something that that's always have in mind. And even with regards to uh, like people organizing revolutionary, like, uh, for revolutionary purposes that you have to keep in mind that and something like just because uh, you're part, either part of some organization or or study some uh, movement or person, right? That just because a certain person said it or they did this, that doesn't necessarily mean, oh, it's automatically good. Because again, we're still dealing with humans. Like, like not everything coming from a or Sekou Toure or Kwame Toure or Omar Shah, Thomas Sakar or Wayne Mandela or Sasha Gore. Like just because they say they say something or did something doesn't necessarily mean that it's quote unquote correct. Like again, like we're still human beings, it depends. Like, it depends on the circumstances. It depends on like what we learn from what happened there. Like if you look at some uh, stuff from like, communists or socialists and anarchists or revolutionary nationalists and so forth, if you if you couldn't tell, they're pretty hard on each other. <laughs> so. That's the one thing you can become like think about it that you also have to take into account that uh, whether some sort of criticism is like from the from primary sources is correct or or why are they saying it that and I think and that's always and that's like the best part is is knowing to like, keep an open mind that you do have some principle that you do have some sort of structure that you're facing. But just because you have that, I mean that. But you also have to make sure that if something challenges it, you have to see. Oh, is is it, is it challenging me because there's something that I'm not thinking of correctly, or not, or to, to take this in mind? And so you always have to constantly reconfigure because without it, that you just you're just being dogmatic, and dogmatism that can lead you to pretty. Uh, not good at let's, let's just say it doesn't lead to it doesn't lead to great things. It can get to get culty, it can get uh very harsh and and just anti anti people. So <laughs> again, you always want to make sure that you're doing things systematically and engage with that. I think I think that's another thing with uh that's this stuff is that sometimes they with like prize versus uh is like to is what way that it can be instrumentalized uh, to do something that that in no way helps that and uh, just and just uh, just keep on constantly keep, keep in mind that it's okay to keep looking that even if it even if you, like if you find something that always con- like always confirms like, maybe it's going back and confirmation but if it always confirms what you're thinking then you say oh. Then you have to think, oh, is it because I automatically found everything that's correct, which is highly unlikely. If you and if it if it is the case, why aren't you leading a movement or part of an organization? <laughs> um, or in most likely the case, I gotta find something extra, some, something different. That say maybe that I think a good part. I think this is one good point with uh, like the Alice line of like sort of. Or like any sort of revolutionary line of, of unity of like struggle, unity, struggle, that you have some you have some friends of all of the and you see like you study like if you're studying history and you're saying, oh, I got this idea of what this organization did. Maybe and then you feel like, oh, there's some more sources. Oh, like it also is a little bit of what like if you're talking about like uh, kind of socialist movements or nations or governments. You see, you might think, oh, oh, they didn't do this right. And you find a source like, oh, they have to protect against uh, some agents in their government, in their cadre or outside sources. And then then that changes the perspective. And then you say, oh, but there were discussions about changing this, but they didn't go through because some people decided to uh, go on their off on their own. They say, oh, there's a mistake there. So again, always want to make sure that you're constantly figuring out that, constantly figuring it out, and that 
you don't have some set idea and then you just stick with it, no matter what, it's okay to have principles, but it's okay if there's something new that comes up that challenges it, probably you to, re- to tweak it, that's fine. So that, that's science. But science, all well, this means that if you have evidence and, and it challenges something, you see how it works and then you change it. So back and forth, just be humble, be curious and get your groups together so you, so you can fight the long battle. <laughs> Absolutely. And of course we have comrades here looking at primary resources. A lot of those times actually talking to people on the front lines. That's if you want to talk about primary resource, that is definitely a primary source. And so our comrades doing that, we have the revolutionary African women. We have our ancestors voices that comes on on Sundays. We have the bi-weekly now or not bi-weekly, uh, well, we have uh, every other week, so uh, twice yes. a month, <laughs> that's a better way of putting it. The so twice a month coming from our comrades in the Tiwa territory slash New Mexico chapter. We have the Pan-African news coming from our comrades there in New Mexico. And we have the Forward Ever podcast. There's podcasts like uh, Millennials Are Killing Capitalism. Uh, there's just a, a lot of sources that are interviewing people on the front lines doing this work. Um, And that is globally fighting colonialism, fighting imperialism. You can see these things. And again, if you have any questions, you can ask us. There's Black Agenda Report. There's uh, Black Alliance for Peace, Black Power Media. So they're doing all, all sorts of things. And again, apologies for just this audio, but We are here still bringing you this information, having this discussion, and we aim to bring you whatever aspect of political education, whether it's visual, whether it's uh, audio, whether it's words, whatever that is, this is important and we are doing it in an organizational way. If uh, you are not doing that, please join an organization. It is of utmost importance if you care about the people's liberation you must do it in a way which is organized. Join an organization because organization decides everything. If you haven't found an organization that you feel like you can roll with, it's okay to create your own organization. As long as it's for the people's liberation, we support it. It doesn't have to be our organization. It doesn't have to be any other ones. But uh, if you are for the people, for the people's liberation, we are here to support you. So thank you so much for listening (laughs) to another episode of Petula Podcast. We will be here with you next week. Thank you once again. Forward ever, backwards never. Forward.